Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Laureen Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Kenneth Stanley. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lorene. Really happy to be here. Well, you are an associate professor at the University of Central Florida. You're a computer scientist, an artificial intelligence researcher, and you're here on sabbatical with the Santa Fe Institute. That's right. So that's how we get to have you. Mm -hmm. You are the co-author with Joel Lehman of this fascinating book, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. And the subtitle is? The Myth of the Objective. What is the objective? What do you mean, the myth of the objective? So when I'm talking about the myth of the objective, I'm talking about the fact that so many things that we do in our lives and in our culture are guided by what we call objectives. It's like it's something that you set that you want to achieve, and you say, this is now my objective, or this is our objective as a society or as an institution or something like that. And we believe, and this is like a really deeply entrenched aspect of our culture, that by setting an objective, it makes it possible to achieve it. And the message of the book, and the reason we call it the myth of the objective, is that actually many times, and this is a surprise, having an objective can actually prevent you from achieving your objective. Well, it is a surprise, and, and, and something that we intuit, but the fact that you've come through it through computer science, and you wonder how many times does a, a, a theory in computer science affect our real life, but you have almost, some have said that this is in a way a scientific proof of serendipity. Yeah, I mean, this is a really unusual story. It's true. You usually don't end up prescribing social policy based on algorithms and computer science. Um, and it was a long, you know, circuitous path for us to get from these scientific experiments to the point where we were actually critiquing certain things about culture and society. It wasn't our intention from the beginning. But that's what the whole book is about. Yeah. It's if kind it had of, been your intention, you wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's like the story behind the book is almost like part of the theme of the book. Well, let's tell us that story. How did you arrive at this through your studies of, of algorithms and artificial intelligence? Right. So so this is going to sound a little off topic, but actually this is the story of how we got to it. We were doing something completely different. We had no idea we were going to get here. But we had created a website on the internet, which is called Pick Breeder, where people can come in and breed pictures. Um, and I know that probably listeners don't really know what that means to breed a picture, like you don't mate a Picasso with a Van Gogh. But, you know, I come from artificial intelligence, and in that field, actually, we had been working on technologies that would allow us to, in effect, give a picture a child. And just as when you have a child, it might look somewhat like you, but be a little bit different, when pick breeder images have children, they also uh, look like their parents, but not exactly. And that allows users to, in effect, breed pictures the way you might breed horses or dogs or something like that. So I know that our audience is going to want to go look at this. So it's www.pickbreeder, P-I-C-B-R-E-E-D-E-R.org. Right. So show us some of the images. Say a person would go to that site and then Track us down the amazing work that you had done. Yeah, so it's really surprising, I think, some of the images that people have discovered. I'm just going to show a few images here that give a sense of uh -huh. what people have discovered. And you can see that these images actually look like um, real things. Like there's a skull there, there's a butterfly, and this is just a small sampling of what people discovered. And it's important to point out that people evolve these things from blobs. That's how things start, just total random blobs. And they got to these amazing images. And that's the beginning of the story of how we came to this realization because we started to look at how people were making these discoveries, um, how people were breeding, say, an image that looks like a car or a skull. Um, and it turns out, and this is sort of where the insight began, that you might expect that if you came into this site and you were trying to breed, breed images like you might breed horses, that you would say, well, I'm trying to breed a butterfly or something. And then you would sort of pick things that look more and more butterfly-like, and that's your objective, and then you get it. 
And we thought that too, but what we discovered was that, in fact, the only way that any of these interesting discoveries were being made was when they were not the objective of the user who bred them. Mm. And this was just a, a huge revelation for us, completely unexpected. And it, it blew me over because it contradicted everything that I understood about achievement and how to get to a, an objective. Show us, I think, one of the, the clearest examples is the uh, image of the alien face, which then through yeah. evolutionary art, as they call this, became the image of a car. And right. tell me how many generations it took. Mm -hmm. But first, let's see the image. So let me show you a, a picture of this alien face. This is a story, part of a story about how this uh, initial realization came about. And um, this alien face, it's important to note, was not bred by me. It was bred by someone else. It had been posted on the site. Um, so that uh, I was able to see that it was there, and then I decided to continue from there, which we call branching. Um, and here's what happened. Um, it was several generations, actually I don't know the exact number, maybe uh, 15 generations or 20 generations, of picking children and continually breeding that then led me to this really surprising discovery, which is a car. Um, so what happened, you know, the story is that the alien face was bred into a car. And what's so important about this is the fact that, you know, I had this experience myself, so I know for a fact I was not trying to evolve a car. Um, and if you put all that together, I mean, just think about how strange this story is. I chose an alien face, which someone else evolved. It wasn't me, so I wouldn't have evolved that myself. And then I evolved a car, which is something that I wasn't trying to evolve. So someone else had to do something that I never would have done, and then I had to not be trying to do what I ultimately did for me to make this discovery. And if you hear that story, it sounds like, wow, that was a, was a big coincidence. You got really lucky that one time. But the amazing thing that we discovered is that that actually is always the story. Almost every interesting discovery in the site has that exact same story. Somebody evolved something that the other person would never have evolved, and then that the second person kind of took it in a handoff and bred it to a place that they weren't actually trying to get to. And that's how you actually find things on Pick Breeder. But one of the most amazing statistics that you told me was that there are some that have taken 50 generations or 90, 74 generations, but then when you programmed a computer to do it, to go from the alien to the car, after 30,000 generations, they could not do it with that intention of going there. They couldn't. The computer, time yeah. again. This is a, a really important point. It's, it's really surprising if you think about it. I mean, what I told you basically is that people find things by not looking for them, but the converse is also really surprising, which is people do not find things by looking for them. Like if you came in there and you wanted to evolve a butterfly, you would fail because as an objective, it's too hard to actually discover. And these experiments that you just described are basically confirmation of that fact in kind of an extreme way by giving it 30,000 generations to try to reproduce an image that already had been discovered. So we know it's even possible. And every time we tried it, each 30,000 generation attempt, it failed. It never succeeded. And it just illustrates that it's sometimes impossible to reach a destination by trying, even though we know that these destinations can be reached because they have been. And I just want to point out again that the image on the cover of your book is one of the butterflies that was evolved from something completely different without trying to make a butterfly. Yeah, that's just another example. Um, and basically every image has that story behind it. And, you know, the reason is kind of important. So you may ask, well, why is it like that? You know, why, why is it that you can only find things by not looking for them? And the reason is because if you think about it, like if you think about the example of the car, an alien face led to that car. No one would ever guess that you can get from an alien face to a car. But if you look closely, in hindsight, you can see that... I think the, you have a picture of the, the, the yeah, eyes Yeah, I can, and I can the show wheels. a connection there. Yeah. Um, that... In fact, the, um, the eyes of the alien turned into the wheels of the car. And this is something that's only obvious in hindsight. Um, but looking forward, you would never realize something like that. And so the point is that the stepping stones, in this case, the stepping stone is this alien face that led to a car. The stepping stones 
never resemble the final product. And that's why you would not know to go through those stepping stones if the final product was your objective. So the only way you can get to these important stepping stones is by not being single-mindedly focused on a single objective. And then you open up all that possibility of eventually reaching these destinations that were not your objective. Now I'm going to expand this a little bit because it is as incredible cultural and social and evolutionary. So it, our world is so governed by objectives and talk about goal oriented, whether it's test scores, scientific funding. I mean, we could go on and on, bottom line profits, career tracks, everything. You, you have a goal and then you work toward that goal. And then what you're saying if the objective paradox is that sometimes you have to give up that goal to achieve what you, you know, something maybe greater. If your goal is making a sandwich, it's very clear what the steps are. Right. But if your goal is to end world hunger or to cure cancer or to make man fly, yeah. you shouldn't be, there's no trajectory that will step by step right. take you there. It often hinders you. Yes. I mean, and I think, you know, we're making a leap here. We're going from picture breeding to how really important discoveries happen. And while this is a strange leap, we should really be concerned when we think about this, you know, because really the, the way that discovery happens is no different from pick breeder. All of us, when we lead, when we discover something, are building on something that was created by our predecessors. And those are the stepping stones. And what this lesson teaches us is that if those stepping stones do not resemble what we're ultimately trying to achieve, then there's almost no way that we're going to actually traverse those stepping stones intentionally. And therefore, we should be worried about a society that's molded in such a way that we're always trying to constrain everything we do through some kind of objective compass, because the effect is going to be that we prune out the stepping stones, which don't look like the objective. And that, in fact, is how we run a lot of our society. Now, serendipity. Let's talk about how, what great discoveries that have been I mean, that, you, your book is full of, it's a fascinating read, is full of these ways that, how about Elvis? Talk to me about Elvis and the microwave and other, some of your favorite yeah. stories. Yeah, sure. So in, uh, the book gives a lot of these examples of, sometimes we call it serendipitous discovery. Um, and these are really important because they illustrate that this is not just about pick breeder. Um, you know, like Elvis is an example because Elvis was not trying to invent rock and roll. Uh, but he, you know, effectively did at least become one of the inventors of rock and roll. Um, and, you know, his colleagues say that he was just playing around and being himself. Um, and, you know, it's almost inconceivable that someone could have an objective of inventing rock and yeah. roll, because if you did, then you probably already invented it. And it just goes to show that there's lots of things like that in life that you, you're not going to run across unless you're not trying to create them. Now, there are more practical things than just rock and roll. I mean, there's things like um, the computer. I like this example. Uh, the, you know, the computers, the first computers were made out of vacuum tubes. So vacuum tubes are a stepping stone that leads to computers. But here's an interesting fact. The people who invented vacuum tubes were not thinking about computers. They were used for electrical experiments. In fact, if your interest had been in computers, why would you be making vacuum tubes? Yeah. It has nothing to do, obviously, with computers. So it's a good thing that their objective was not to make computers or else we wouldn't have them. Um, and these kind of examples, you can go on and on. And the microwave one I like. The microwave one's another good one. Um, yeah. And this is where Percy Spencer, and this is a very serendipitous thing, where he had a candy bar in his pocket, and he was working on radars, which had microwave technology in them, and he noticed that the candy bar melted and suddenly realized, you know what, this actually leads to a microwave oven. So you get radar technology as a stepping stone to microwave ovens. And once again, no way to project looking forward that you go from radars to a new kind of an oven. Um, but looking in hindsight, you can see where the connection came in. Um, and this kind of example happens again and again. And in fact, I, I just would like to, to point the, the viewers to the Wikipedia page on serendipity, where there are tons of examples like this. And the suspicious thing about it, the thing that I think people should take note of is that the people who made these discoveries all have a good track record or all educated or um, have been successful in the past. I mean, if this was just a complete accident, then you wouldn't have these very um, well, uh, well respected people making these discoveries. So it, it suggests that, I think we're going to get to this, that this kind of process of discovery is not pure random. You can actually uh, try to fasten 
your life in such a way that you have more opportunities to encounter this kind of serendipity. And this is something as a society that we can also try to facilitate. Well, um, we're speaking today with Ken Stanley about his new book, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. But as you describe this, again, we have an unconscious understanding, and perhaps it's artists and musicians the most who understand this. Um, Talk to me about stepping stones and talk to me about how how we can live in a way that we are um, aware of these evolutionary steps uh, mm-hmm. what do you call it treasure hunter what is it who who would be a treasure hunter how do we become treasure hunters yeah so the natural question that follows from the story that i've kind of given so far is well how do we make this happen yeah you know it sounds nice that well we can all just do whatever we want but what's the real formula here that actually someone can key in on and the answer is that when you look at a system like pick breeder, what we're actually observing when we came to understand what was happening, why people were making all these discoveries, is that the system as a whole, the website in this example, is collecting stepping stones. Every time someone comes to that website and discovers something and publishes it to the, to the community, uh, everybody can see it. You know, like the alien face that I saw that I eventually evolved into a car. That's a stepping stone. So the more stepping stones people publish, the more opportunities or departure points are created for further discovery. And that's what I mean by a stepping stone collector. And it's it's in our interest to try to fashion society, especially the parts of it that are focused on innovation or discovery, as a stepping stone collector. And I sometimes also, like you said, call it a treasure hunter because you can think of these as treasures that are sort of buried. We don't know what they are. It's not an objective, but we know that there's lots of interesting stuff out there and we go hunting and trying to uncover them as much as we can. Um, you, yeah. You're used to the word interesting. So you have created a, ver- a, a noun, I don't know if it exists, but it's called interestingness, right? And you say that the scent of interestingness can lead us across these chains of stepping stones into who knows what. But because we do this because it's interesting, and when people are choosing those images, it's just the one that kind of interests them. They're not thinking Mm -hmm. about the ratios or the proportion. And so when you're guided by your own instinct, where will this take you? Yeah, so we tend not to trust people's instincts. I mean, that's one of the morals here is when we talk about interestingness, that's the scent you have to follow if you don't have an objective. You know, you're saying, well, which path should I follow? And you don't know where any of them lead because there's no objective. That doesn't mean that you can't make an intelligent decision. Uh, Often people will follow the path that's most interesting to them. And what we've kind of done as a culture is decided that that's not a legitimate thing to do. In other words, we say that just about anything that you do has to somehow be objectively validated. You have to say what your objective is, and then we have to prove that you're actually moving towards that objective, which means that nobody can get away with actually following the scent of interestingness. If you think about you know, accountability and metrics, and these things are pervasive in our society, they're all objectively driven, and they're all pruning out this concept of interestingness, which ultimately means we don't trust people to use their instincts or their expertise, and we think it's too risky to let them do that, and so we're pruning out all of the creative possibilities that those people could potentially uncover. So here we have the objective paradox, which is to achieve our highest goals, we must be willing to abandon them. And then how can we create an environment for ourselves to go against the myth of the objective? Because you're saying working toward an objective is not going to do it. So <clears throat> you have posited a day without objectives. What would that do? And you say that not meeting our objectives, which are superimposed on us or come from within. It's very stressful. You feel like an underachiever because you didn't win the Nobel Prize today. And how would society be different just even if we could take some time off from objectives? For kids, for example. Yeah, I mean, and you could think about this in the context of like the education system where people just saturated with things like standardized tests. Um, and this is no doubt. I mean, every most people have an instinct that this is having a bad effect on children. And, you know, we've done experiments, um, further experiments beyond Pick Breeder, where we, we actually formalized Pick Breeder in a computer program. We called it Novelty Search, which we used to kind of demonstrate and show that it is actually possible to implement this principle in practice 
and use it to make discoveries that are useful. And one of the things that we found in these experiments is that allowing things to make mistakes and do things that we think are objectively perhaps bad or subpar actually leads them eventually to discovering really important skills and uh, abilities. And so that might be a difference if we could allow people to do that, is that we would get to places that we couldn't get to uh, in a more efficient and also satisfying way. Well, you talk about it being a different path to achievement, and you did have in the novel research, you had a program where uh, you created a jogger, and mm -hmm. um, I think you have a, an illustration of, of this jogger, and his, the, the jogger's job was to go down through these walls and, well, tell me, tell me what you're... Uh, yeah, so we made this program which is a kind of demonstration of this uh, principle, this non-objective principle. Um, and, you know, Pick Breeder has humans in the loop. Humans are making decisions. We wanted to show that we can do this completely inside of a computer, and, you know, it's partly because I'm an AI researcher, so people in my field want computers to do stuff on their own that's intelligent. Mm -hmm. But usually, in the field of artificial intelligence, if you were making a program to train a robot to walk, you w and here I'll show a picture of what this yeah. robot looks like. This is a robot in a different kind of steps of walking. Uh, usually if you were trying to do something like this, um, you, would, you would reward the robot in some sense for getting better at walking. So it's like if it can get farther, it's better. And then we would elaborate on that strategy, and then we get better and so forth. What we did is we created this program called Novelty Search, which does not try to improve with respect to walking. Rather... It just says you're doing a good job if you're doing something different than you've done mm -hmm. before. And so it falls on its face. It does all kinds of stupid things. But if it falls on its face in a different way, that's good. We say, great. That means that that's a stepping stone that we should explore further to see what might happen if we elaborate on that idea. And in so doing, eventually it actually led to walkers. And it actually led to walking robots that walk better than the ones that were trained uh, by rewarding them for trying uh, to pursue the objective. Mm -hmm. So it kind of demonstrated this point in a real concrete, you know, scientific, empirical way. So one of the things that you say, it's sometimes better to start from where you are instead of where you want to go. Talk to me about the Wright brothers. Yeah, so there's, you know, when you think about objectives, what an objective really is, it's about comparing where you are to where you want to be. Um, and... The, when you talk about something like novelty, which is not an objective concept, novelty is basically comparing where you are to where you've been before. Um, and for some reason, we don't like doing that. We want to always compare ourselves to the future. Um, but something like the Wright brothers, we can view, you know, sometimes that's used as a counterexample. It's like, well, wow, they, they wanted to build something that can fly, and then they did. But we can also view it as the Wright brothers were at the right stepping stone at the right time and realized that right at that moment, um, the stepping stones had been laid, so this is where they are right now, that have suddenly enabled us to move in a direction towards flight. And they were bicycle manufacturers. I mean, they were making mechanic. bicycles. Yeah, so right. in some sense for them, a bicycle was a stepping stone that kind of made an analogy with a plane, and they saw that you can bridge that gap. Um, so, you know... Sometimes it makes sense to just sort of appreciate the possibilities of where you are as opposed to saying this is this long-term vision that we need to achieve and everything I do will now be compared to that. We only have a couple of minutes left. Steve Jobs talks about this a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, because he was in college, he dropped out, he took a calligraphy class. He said, only looking back can I see how one thing led to another. And that's why Apple and his products were as, as beautiful and as sensible as they were. Yeah, I mean, Steve Jobs, he could have been a, a co-author of this book because his life was really kind of lived in the spirit. Um, and, you know, like this calligraphy class that he took, and he didn't know that this was going to lead to, like, a revolution in computer fonts um, until, uh, in hindsight, he saw that a connection mm -hmm. was there. And he's a lot of stories like this, like he dropped out of college, and that's what allowed him to take the calligraphy class. But most people would not think of dropping out of a college as an objectively good decision. <laughs> Um, so, you know, a lot of people have done great things, have followed this philosophy in some sense. Well, you have taken your research in the physical world into the metaphysical. And there's overtones of, of Zen Buddhism and a lot of paths that say if there's no destination, every path is the right path because it moves you along. In the last part of your book, I just want to read this beautiful sentence sure. of yours. Yeah. It's called uh, Farewell to the... A farewell to the Mirage, that's the, the chapter. The Mirage of object, 
Right, this mirage that objectives can get you where you want to go. And you say, when all is said and done, even when visionaries grow weary of stale visions, when the ash of unrequited expectation settles on the cloak of the impenetrable future, there is but one principle that may yet pierce the darkness. To achieve our highest goals, we must be willing to abandon them. Yeah, I mean, that sort of recaps the book. That's the concluding paragraph. Um, and it's, it's a difficult pill to swallow. Um, it sounds strange. You know, giving up objectives is like you're giving up a security blanket. Um, but I hope that the evidence there is compelling enough to make people think twice about using objectives for almost everything that we do in our culture because it is going to lead to this kind of ash falling on the cloak of yeah. the impenetrable future. Yes. Um, and your book is full of examples, I mean, f- from history that we all know and understand, of people who have given up their their stated objective just to find out and discover what was out there. And look what it's done for our world. I must tell you, Kenneth, your book, I think this is a stepping stone. Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. I really urge people to read it. You're, you're in challenging territory here, and I think it's really life-changing. I want people to read your book, and I'm so grateful that you, our guest today, is Ken Stanley. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to have this opportunity to get this message out. Yes, yes. And I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. I'm Lorene Mills. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.